If you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty, if you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength, if you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ, if you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Considering Catholicism. Deep Dives. This is the sixth episode in this deep dive series into Catholicism and the Bible. And let's kick it off with a simple question. How should we read the Bible? More specifically, how does the Catholic Church read the Bible? Now, I don't mean mechanically how do you read it, like reading it silently or out loud or moving your lips while scanning your forefinger across the page. And I don't mean where or when, like on a train or in the rain or in a house or with a mouse. What I mean is, how do you make sense out of what the Bible says? What expectations do you bring to reading it? How should you mentally frame a passage of Scripture so that you can understand it? There's no avoiding this question, because whether you reflect on it or not, you're going to have to answer it every time you pick up the Bible or listen to a verse or story in the Bible read to you. There's a huge range of possibilities, and you can find teachers and preachers and writers and politicians and ordinary folks who read the Bible from completely different vantage points. For example, you can read the Bible as a literal history book. When you read the story of Noah's Ark or David killing Goliath, you can read them as straight-up accounts of what happened. Other folks see the Bible completely through the lens of Jesus, of his love for us, and his desire for us to be saved. Now, if you come at it this way, whether Bible stories are literally true or not is somewhat irrelevant. Because with this approach, the stories of Scripture are there to inspire us to follow Christ and to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Or you can read the Bible as moral lessons and wise advice, like Aesop's fables. From this perspective, the Bible isn't intended to be taken literally, and it isn't intended to convert you to some particular religious viewpoint. From this perspective, the Bible is simply meant to remind us of universal moral truths like love your neighbor and be tolerant and have hope and practice kindness to strangers. I'm sure you get the idea. You will and do read the Bible through some lens, like one of the ones above. But the question for today is, which is the right lens? How is the Bible meant to be understood? And since this deep dive is about Catholicism and the Bible, how does the Catholic Church read and understand the Bible? Which lens does it use? Fortunately, we don't have to speculate or guess. The Church very explicitly explains it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in paragraphs 115 through 119. You can read those for yourself online, but let me summarize them for you. Now, every time I teach about this in a classroom, I have a diagram on the handouts or on the whiteboard behind me. But since we don't have either of those here on the podcast, I'm going to ask you to imagine the diagram. So, imagine the whiteboard with a vertical line down the middle, dividing it into two halves, left and right. In your mind, label the left side literal. Label the right side spiritual. Those mean exactly what they sound like. The literal sense means that if the Bible says David killed Goliath with a stone to the forehead, that there was a young man named David and he 
killed a Philistine warrior with a shot from his sling. That's the left side of the board. The right side means that there is also a spiritual interpretation to a passage. In other words, we can also understand David's victory as having spiritual significance, both when it happened and for us today. Okay, got that? Now, the catechism puts some bullet points on the spiritual side of the board. Because when we say that the story can have spiritual significance, there are three subpoints, three ways that it can be spiritually significant. Those three subpoints are allegorical, moral, anagogical. Let's take those one by one. The allegorical sense means that the passage points toward Christ. Jesus said that the whole Old Testament points to him. And as we've seen in this deep dive series, Christ is the Word of God. And the written scriptures are all expressions of the eternal Word made incarnate in Christ. Therefore, for any verse or passage of scripture, we should be able to see its Christological dimension, its spiritual significance in Christ. In fact, in the New Testament, the apostles are constantly unpacking the allegorical significance of the Old Testament as it foreshadowed and highlighted Christ. The second of the three subpoints on the spiritual side of the board is the moral sense. The events reported in Scripture ought to lead us to act justly. As St. Paul says, they were written for our instruction. Scripture prompts us, it teaches us, it shapes us, it disciples us to grow in maturity, to conform ourselves more and more to the image and likeness of Christ in us. And so, it's legitimate to ask of any passage, how can this make me a better follower of Christ? The last of the three subpoints on the spiritual side of the board is a fancy word, the anagogical sense. Now, that term comes from the Greek word, which means leading. It means that we can view the words, the stories, and events of the Bible in terms of their eternal significance, how they point us or lead us toward our true and eternal home, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God when Christ returns and makes all things new. To summarize, the Catholic Church teaches that there are four senses to Scripture, four legitimate ways or modes that we can read the Bible. We can read it either literally or spiritually, and the spiritual dimension can include allegorical, moral, and anagogical senses. The Catechism actually quotes a Catholic saying from the Middle Ages to help us remember these senses of Scripture. That medieval couplet went, The letter speaks of deeds, allegory to faith, the moral how to act, and anagogy our destiny. Okay, up till now, this episode has been pretty academic, pretty abstract. The best way to illustrate these four senses is just to give you some examples. So let's take four well-known passages from the Bible, two from the Old Testament and two from the New Testament, and unpack each of them according to these four senses. That'll show you how this works in practice. Let's begin with the sacrifice of Isaac, recorded in Genesis 22. If you recall, God tells Abraham to take his son Isaac up to a mountain and there sacrifice him to the Lord. Reading this passage in the literal sense, it describes God's command to Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac and the intervention of an angel to stop the sacrifice, providing a ram as a substitute. Reading this story in the allegorical sense, we can see that it prefigures the sacrifice of Christ. Isaac carrying the wood for the sacrifice symbolizes Jesus carrying the cross. The ram caught in the thicket represents Jesus as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Reading this story in the moral sense, we can see that it teaches the importance of obedience and faith in God. Abraham is willing to sacrifice his beloved son, which demonstrates complete trust 
and submission to God's will, something that we should learn as well. Reading this story through the anagogical sense, we see that the sacrifice of Isaac is a foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ, which leads all of us to reflect on the promise of eternal life and the fulfillment of God's covenant. One story and four senses are legitimate ways to read it. Now let's consider Exodus 14, where the Israelites cross the Red Sea, being chased by Pharaoh's army. Reading it literally, we can see it describes the miraculous event where God parted the Red Sea through Moses, allowing the Israelites to escape from the pursuing Egyptians, who were then drowned. Reading it in the allegorical sense, we can see that the crossing of the Red Sea is a symbol of baptism. Just as the Israelites were saved from slavery and death through the waters, Christians are saved from sin and death through the waters of baptism. Reading this story through the moral sense, it encourages us to trust God's deliverance and power. When we find ourselves in desperate straits, it emphasizes the importance of following God's guidance and leadership. And reading this story in the anagogical sense, we can see it symbolizing the passage from the bondage of sin to the freedom of eternal life. The crossing of the Red Sea points to the final victory over evil and the journey towards the heavenly promised land. One story, four senses, or legitimate ways to read it. Let's turn to the New Testament, and let's look at John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. Reading this story in the literal sense, we can see that Jesus fed a large crowd with five loaves of bread and two fish, resulting in 12 baskets of leftovers after everyone had been satisfied. Reading it in the allegorical sense, we can see that the feeding of the multitudes symbolizes the Eucharist, where Jesus provides spiritual nourishment through his body and blood, and the miracle foreshadows the Last Supper and the sacrificial love of Christ. The moral sense of the story emphasizes the importance of sharing and generosity. It teaches the value of trusting in God's provision and the call to serve others with whatever we have. The anagogical sense of the story points to the heavenly banquet, the eternal feast in the kingdom of God. It signifies the fulfillment of God's promise to provide for his people eternally. Let's do one more, the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2. The literal sense of the story is Jesus performs his first miracle at a wedding in Cana, turning water into wine, especially when his mother asked him to. The allegorical sense of the story points to the transformation of water into wine, symbolizing the new covenant in Christ and replacing the old covenant, bringing the joy of salvation. The moral sense of this story highlights the importance of faith in Jesus and the transformative power of his grace in our lives. It also underscores the importance of obeying him, as when Mary tells the servants, do whatever he tells you and the importance of turning to his mother for intercession. And finally, the anagogical sense of the story points to the heavenly banquet and the eternal joy and union with Christ in heaven, which is so often in Scripture characterized as a wedding feast. So, that's how the Catholic Church instructs us to read the Bible always paying attention to the four senses or modes that Scripture speaks to us through. And let me just say, it's perfectly legitimate for a priest, a pastor, a deacon, or any other teacher to emphasize one of these senses over the others in any particular homily or lesson. So, if the Old Testament reading for a Mass is the sacrifice of Isaac, Father doesn't need to unpack all four senses that morning. He can focus on any one of those senses that he feels we need to hear that day. Just always remember that the Bible is bigger than any one homily or lesson. In your whole life, you'll never be able to fully grasp all of the richness and width and depth of the written Word of God. But even with understanding these four senses, it's possible to take any one of these too far in one direction and 
run off the road into a ditch, so to speak. So, the church provides guardrails on the highway of biblical interpretation, rules of the road for teaching and preaching from Scripture. Those rules have a fancy technical name, hermeneutics, and that will be the topic of the next lesson in this series. I hope you're enjoying this deep dive series into Catholicism and the Bible. If you do, please rate and review the podcast. That really helps. And send me your comments and questions through the website, consideringcatholicism.com, or by emailing me at consideringcatholicism at gmail.com. And it takes more time and resources than we really have to produce this podcast. If you find it valuable, would you consider helping to keep it going by supporting it with a one-time or recurring donation? God bless, and join me for the next episode as we dive even deeper into Catholicism and of the Bible.